So I bought this CL55 AMG at a tow lot auction. A local tow lot closed down. I bought five cars. And this is one of them. Unfortunately, it's from the state of Wisconsin, which is corrosion central. At least that's been my experience. And the roof is corroded. This car is aluminum. I don't have a key. It's been sitting since at least 2016. And uh, she's a little rough. I don't know that this car is necessarily worth fixing. It's definitely a good parts car for what I paid for it. It was cheap, 1200 bucks. It's got good brakes on it. M113K supercharged V8. I don't know if it runs. I can't even get the hood open. So now I'm going to remove the EIS, which is the ignition. And I'm going to take that over to my buddy's shop and we're going to program a key for that and I'll bring it back. We'll see if this thing can come alive, if I can even figure out how to get the hood open. All righty. There's the EIS or ignition. We're going to take this over to my buddy's shop, get a key program for it. That's the next step. So I'm over at my buddy's shop, Spartan Auto Works, and we have that Mercedes EIS on this crazy contraption here. And we are going to read some data from it so that we can program a brand new aftermarket key. All right, Eric, walk us through the process. Okay, so what we're going to use here is VBDI uh, prong to read the EIS so we can save all the password calculation. When it comes to the 215, 220, 230, this is the best way to do it. So we're using a click and go uh, from LA Car Tech. And you have to get the appropriate adapter. You can also use this on the IM608 as well, um, which requires an appropriate intermediate adapter. So we're going to put this in the click and go, or VIS in the click and go. We're going to assemble the VVDI prog with the adapter, and then we're going to set up to read. We've got it all connected, and now we're going to read some data out of the EIS. Okay, so we got our settings over here verified. We have power to our VVDI prog because that's what we'll need for this particular uh, read. So now it's going to read. It's going to unlock the chip. Ooh, lights. Oh, right. I missed it. You get it? Okay, so now it's all now it's all read out. So now we're going to save this file, and we're going to have to put it into VVDIMB. You could use uh, CGIMB. There's a couple different programs you could use, but now we're going to put it into VVDIMB to make the key and calculate the password. Now we've loaded up VVDIMB, which is what we're going to use to make the, the key itself. So I'm going to set the key into VVDIMB. We're going to load our EIS file, which is the hex, or hex file we just read, which is right here. So we're going to open that. So now it's going to show us our keys and our key hash. So there's already four keys programmed to the car. So we'll just add key number five. So we are going to, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and make all these keys. Uh, not that it really matters, but we're just gonna go ahead and prepare the key file and then we'll come back and show you how to actually burn the key. Now we have our key file made. We're gonna go to read and write key. We need to identify the key, make sure it's a clear key. So it's a brand new key, a brand new aftermarket key. We're gonna load our key file. So we're gonna come down here to key five V51, open. We're going to write our key. Writing success, identification of key. There it is. Now this use time and some of that really doesn't matter. And now we'll reassemble the EIS and test it on the bench real quick. All right, so we got our new key. We got it hooked up to our test test gateway here. Plug it in. Let it drop the key. Uh, we're gonna plug it in. Good to go. All right. Fire up the car. So how's that for making a key in a minute or less? That's great. Well, it's 9 p.m. The kids are in bed and I'm up here at work because I refuse to be beaten by this hood. This hood doesn't have fists. But regardless, I got to get this thing open. I had my guys drag it in and put it on the rack so that I could at least get underneath it because this hood latch, it will not let go. And yes, I know I could cut the hood. The hood is valuable. I could go through the headlight that's worth some money in the fender. Everything here has some value. So I, my goal here is to get this hood open without damaging anything. It may be impossible, but we're going to get the hood open one way or another. Well, now this is the first time I've been underneath this thing and she's got some cobwebs and some rust and a hole in 
whatever shield this is. Yeah. Ooh, what is this? A leaking ABC shock? No way! That doesn't happen! It's fine. It's a parts car. Fine. Still got cats on it, so that's good. Those were once very expensive. But what I need to do is get through this jungle of cobwebs and junk. I've kind of taken some of this apart already, but not, not enough to get anywhere. So now I'm going to lower it down a little bit. We're going to knock the wheel off of it. We're going to take the inner fender out, and we're going to see if we can get to where we need to get to. Ah, oh, very nice. That was a concern of mine, that that wheel wouldn't come off. They do that, you know. Is that enough? I've already... Yes! That did not help me. I mean, it kind of helps me. I'm going to go up a little bit. I don't know if we can get through this or not. It's going to be tough. So I'm just looking at how tall I am, or lack thereof. And I need to get right there. So this is going to be um, an ordeal. It's going to be fine. I mean, we'll get it open. It's just a matter of what survives and what doesn't. I, mean, I suppose I could take some more of these brackets out. This one could come out easily, but that's not going to help me. Let's pull the lower splash guard down so that I still don't have enough room. I am going to wear my safety glasses because you never know. It could be a bunch of rodentia up here. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of ick. I gotta get this out of the way. What am I doing? Sometimes I don't even know. Ah, oh, I regret that decision. Oh well, it'll sweep up. Oh, it's crusty under here. So I gotta get my hand up this. Looks like I've got an ABC line. Oh, there's all kinds of speeders up there. Subframe is kind of in the way. Fans definitely in the way. But I think I can get this line out. I can get some movement on this line right here. I think I can do this. Whether I can un unlock that latch or not, that's, uh, that's another question. Okay. How far can I get? Uh, it's not very promising. It's halfway up the fan. Ooh, we are we are really running into some problems here. I am so looking forward to this. What if I go? Oh man, this is. I don't have small enough arms for this this job. And I thought we were onto something. Let's look at this a little bit different way. I'm gonna try to find an access point to the cables. I don't know if that's going to be possible or not, but we're going to try. Don't need that. I don't know if I can get my hand up yonder or not. We'll find out. I can't feel a thing. I didn't think this was going to work, but I had to try it. I think I'm about uh, a few inches off here. I can feel... Ooh, there's a there's some stuff. Nothing of any kind of importance that I can open that or pull on that cable with. So we're gonna have to uh yeah, we're gonna have to cut. Yep. Let's get the tools. Hmm. Okay. Well, we started cut no, I'm just kidding. Let's uh let's move the camera so I don't ruin it. Oh I got smoke coming up from up there. Okay. Hopefully there's nothing too important above it. Blue, I need you. I don't know that this is going to help us, but I do know that we are going to try it. Oh boy, there's a harness right above it. Great placement. All right, we'll be all right, I hope. I'm sure it's nothing major. 
Yeah, that was right into the harness. Neat. Well, I'll have to fix that, but here's our cable. And there's the box where it goes from one to two. So if I just Yes. I really tried hard to figure out where I was going to cut. I was unsuccessful, clearly, but it's nothing some butt connectors can't fix. You want to be gentle. Whoa. Okay, I see the cables. They look bad. Let's see if we can break this box. Did that pop it? No way. Nope, I didn't pop it. I know what you guys think. I just ruined this car. First off, whoever parked this thing and didn't come back for it, they ruined it. Second, no one is going to fix this because I'm going to destroy it getting the hood open. Yeah. Don't go back in your hole. Don't do that. Here, I know what to do. There, now you can't go back home. That felt wonderful. All right, so I don't know which one's which here. Two cables. I think this is the most work I've ever gone through to get a hood open. I think it's this cable right here. We have to break that into pieces. I don't think I'm any better off than I was. The other problem is I don't know which one's which, so, so we have that to contend with. Okay, that's and all that's left is this nub. Oh, I'm moving the car in an unsafe fashion. Did that do it? I don't I doubt it. No, it sure didn't. I was hopeful. Oh come on. This is tough. Well, one cable broke, and it feels like that was the cable I needed. Oh my god, it's winning! Make sure we get this real tight on here. This is almost a lost cause, you guys. But I don't give up that easily. Please. That's not gonna help us. Can I see anything from the hole I've created though? I can see the area of the lash. Can I get my hand in here without cutting it? No. This is gonna slice me up like Edward Scissorhands. We don't need that. What a great design. I mean, there, you can't get the hood open if you don't own the car, so that's nice. I'm probably in the air arena. I could also try to go in, I guess, through the grill. The grill's not in the best shape, and I really hate to cannibalize any other parts. I guess if I push this harness out of the way, I might be able to open this hole big enough to get my whole hand in there. I guess that's the next step. All right. Oh, I cut through an AC line. We didn't need that. Hey, at least there's no Freon in it. Could have been bad. Look at the size of the hole now. See if I can 
feel anything. And the goal here is also to not cut myself. Oh, I feel where it attaches. Let's, uh, let's make this hole bigger a little bit. Oh, there's an ABS. Who put an ABS pump here? I didn't do that. Oh man, we are, we are so close. All this just to get the hood open. Oh, I think I can, I think I can do this, but it's going to be real dumb. Is there anything down here? No, I'm going to open up this area all the way down to about here. Let's see. So much room, but did it help me? I don't know guys, I think it helped. All right, we're gonna operate strictly off the of feel. It's not a really good angle for either of my arms, unless I go, nope, nope. Maybe if I laid across the hood and then I couldn't pop it. The nice thing is the mount, the ABS is mounted in this, these rubber pins. If you push up really hard, you can get them out of where they're supposed to go. It's sealed. The latch is sealed. Who, who did this? Unless there's some, something I can jam a screwdriver into. Who designs this stuff? And also, why do I still want one? Let's try some stuff. All right, I've, I've really done some damage here. I think I'm getting pretty close. All right, there's the sheathing from the cable. Let's try to pull on the cable again. I think I'm just gonna have to keep prying on it. I'll try the cable one more time. There's no way that's it. No. <laughs> well, it's dropping rocks. I see the latch moving. Oh, come on. Let's go get something to wedge into that hood. All right, we're just gonna wedge this trim tool. Ow, that didn't feel good. That would just be too easy. What in tarnation is happening? I'm moving the latch, I can see it. Ha ha, ha ha, yeah. Yes. Yes. Where is the release? It's right here. Okay. We're going to just uh, let that sit and simmer. Drop this car down. What a disaster that was. So it may be hard to see, but you can see I had to open up the core support. I did use a really long sawzall blade and carefully avoided the ABS pump motor. And then I was able to get to this, bend the, the latch back, at least the, the part that holds the cable that was broken. And then if I pull on this and pried on where the uh, loop or whatever the hook is on the hood, that's how I was able to get it popped. What a fight. Okay, first time this hood's been open in years. Oh, she's crusty. But the hood, the hood stays up. This little, ah, what a pain. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where do I start? Definitely looks like uh, five old Mouskowitz has been in here. Hopefully it hasn't been chewed on too many things and hopefully this thing will start. There is, should be a place to put power under here. So jump point, please. So it's pretty dusty and dingy, but Nothing's taken apart. It's missing the lid here. I wonder why. And boy, is she rusty. So let's see. Is there anything that I can use behind here? Uh, nope. So now it looks like I get to pull the floorboard. Well, not the floorboard, but the there's like a panel up here, and I think I have access. Excuse 
excuse me, there. I think I have access to the power wire, the battery cable behind this. Ah, uh, yes, I see the battery cable. So I'm gonna spend a minute and get this apart so that we can uh, have access to that cable. All right, I've got this peeled back. You can see the junction block. Let's see if this car will power up at all. Come on, do something. Oh, that's a spark there for a second. It's around this so that you can't do this. Oh, we have dash lights. Stuff's happening. I don't know what it is. Let's see if we can pop the trunk. <laughs> no. That would be just too awesome. All right, well, I'm gonna go get the key and the ignition, and we're gonna get that plugged in, see if we can power this thing on. Well, I've got our key with ignition. I've got two connectors. Well, it seems to be unhappy. Well, I uh, I got it reconnected, and look at that, 143,000 miles. Now, I don't know if the ignition turns. Sorry if this is dark. Ignition still does not turn. Well, at least I know the miles. I still want to get in the trunk. Maybe this will do it. Doesn't sound like anything's happening. Negative. Neat. All right, I've got my uh, programmer here. We're going to see if we can get it to wake up the EIS module, which is the ignition key, and let us turn it S-type. 221. Also not what this is. This may not work. Sometimes we just got to try stuff. That's not working. Okay, so we're a little further now. I've got my power probe hooked up to power. We're gonna go over and apply 12 volts to one of the terminals on the EIS, which is the ignition switch, and see if this thing comes alive. Let's see if we can't give power to terminal 15. I doubt this is gonna work. Still can't turn the ignition. But stuff's happening. Fans running. Oh, look at all the dust. Stuff's unhappy. Hopefully my uh, little incident with the harness isn't causing any problems. Let's see. Oh, it's angry. One headlight works. Fan works. Cluster's lit up. I don't know if I can get it started with the power probe. That might be an ordeal. Oh, it says no miles, so we got some problems. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what my guys sacrificed to the trunk opening deities, but they got the trunk open without destroying anything. I don't know what they did. But the only thing that was actually in here that really helps us in any way and doesn't help us at all is easy access to the battery terminals and the battery is dated. 6 of 14. So to give you an idea of probably how old this or how long this car has been sitting, I don't think there's very many nine-year-old batteries still left, but what we're going to do next is we're going to test for all the powers and grounds at the EIS and hopefully we find a problem that we can easily rectify. Okay, Doki, I have uh, everything connected. I've got a jump box in it. I think this is the one from the car. We're gonna be able to back probe this, I hope. This is pretty tight quarters. Let's find a good ground. I have, this is my favorite power determining device. All right, I've got, that's three, two. I do not have power at terminal one. I have it at two and I have three. And then I don't know what terminal four is and it doesn't look like five is used. So let's go look at the wiring diagram. All right, terminal one is, well, it's terminal 15. That's a, it's terminal assignment one, but they call it terminal 15. I'm missing that. There's a, a starter relay. Looks like there's a fuse. 
So we need to see, we need to go to the right front fuse relay module. This is right rear of engine compartment. See if we have power right here. And if, it, if we do, or if we don't, either way, we're gonna check this fuse, fuse 29 is 20 amper. The fuse that we're chasing is in here, but I don't see any 20s, which is uh, alarming. And everything's a little crusty in here. As a matter of fact, I don't really remember taking the cover off of this, but maybe I did. I did bring a bunch of extra fuses. I see something that's a little suspicious right here. Uh, that's a destroyed, looks like a 10 amp, or at least that's what it was. Oh, that didn't go the way I planned. I see why it's destroyed. It looks like somebody tried to get it out and it is, um, it's fused. Well, there's half of it. I don't know what they used to try to get this out, but it doesn't take that much effort. Okay. So that was a red fuse, which is a 10 amp. And I don't really want to put another one in because it was blown. This just goes straight for the fire and put a 20 in there. I have no idea if that's what it's supposed to be. Before we go any further, I'm going to check the rest of these fuses to see how they look. Just do a quick vis on them. I don't see anything else popped. It might be a five amp right here that's a little fishy. That one just fell apart. All these fuses are just trash. They're just corroded. This clearly has some moisture in it. This box might be a, a problem too. Will you just, there. I'm going to try some unconventional things here. I mean, conventional for this place, but unconventional for your regular repair. I've got the jump box attached, got my power probe attached, and we're going to take the power probe. We're going to apply it to terminal 15, which wakes everything up. I'm going to see if we can do that real quick. All right, the dash is powered on. Fan is powered on. See, we go, there we go. Fan is angry. We're going to ignore that loud noise. And what I've decided to do is be the starter relay. Now, I've already checked the oil. There's a dipstick right there. So we're going to pull the relay in. And it died. What happened? Let's go find out. Well, it, it shut this terminal down. So let's try that again. See if we can turn this back on. I hope I don't have to be the relay and turn this back on because I don't have long enough arms for that. All right, we're powered back on. There goes the fan. We're gonna go around the backside so it's not quite so loud. I bet you the same thing's gonna happen, but you know, it's worth a shot. Here we go. Nope. Okay, let's try something else. Well, it might be hard to see, but I've got the button zip tied down on the power probe. This is a bad idea. Don't try this stuff. And now we're going to try this again. Probably let the smoke out of something, but it's fine. It's cranking. That's promising. Doesn't sound so good though. Let's uh, give it a little ether because I don't think it's getting any fuel. Okay, so this is gonna be the best way to do this, I think. I think there's some hoses and stuff down here. I don't know if I can take this all the way off or not. Oh, there's a clip, okay. So there's one crankcase hose, that's fine. We're just gonna set that aside. We're gonna open the throttle body, spray it in. Hopefully this thing barks off a little bit, or maybe it doesn't. We gotta try it. That's probably good, but that's better. All right, I'm gonna go power everything up. All right, time to be the starter relay. Uh, 
it wants to. It almost fired. Let's load it up with a bunch more fuel. No, I needed those. Come back. No, uh, I think there's still some circuit that's just unhappy, but the, the engine is uh, not locked up, so that's a good sign. Now I made it angry. Probably ought to let the starter cool off for a minute. Or not. No, we're killing the battery, but I think it'll run. But I see some not so great looking things that is probably gonna keep me from trying much harder. Let me uh, shut this down and I'll show you what I, I'm looking at. That's, uh, that's bad. That supercharger pulley is, is not good. You should never see the ball bearings exposed. There should be an outer cover. As you can see, it's starting to come apart. It's actually come apart. It's, it's pretty much gone. So I don't know how much more I wanna mess with this. Um, I don't really have the, the, an extra pulley. I don't have the tools to try to fix this. This might end up being a, uh, a compression and leak down test at a later date, but I really want to hear it run. We're going to try a little bit, a few more things to see if we can close the fuel pump relay at the same time. All right, contact. See, that sounded good. It wants to start. The fuel could be bad too. There's so many variables right now. I don't think it's getting fuel. All right, we're gonna tear into this. This is the fuel pump cover and we're gonna get this removed and see what's behind. Well, that's pretty messed up. Well, I can feel that there's some, this is warm. This has some temperature in it, which means that it's, it's been seeing some voltage, some power. I don't see anything leaking, but I bet you this thing's locked up. It's got a little couple taps of the hammer while all power is applied and we may have fuel pressure again. We're gonna try that. Okay, now I'm going to check the fuel pump to see what it sounds like, what power. I've got my uh, power probe hooked up to my jump box. I just heard something make noise. So I don't know what that was. I'm gonna go by color here. That should tell us which one's power. Yeah, okay, so this one's ground. Because brown on, on uh, German cars or on European cars is earth, typically speaking. So now, it is shorted. Okay, let's get uh, the fuel pump defibrillator. This is going to take a little bit of uh, effort here, but it'll, it's going to be fine, guys. Nope. That's not how we're going to do it. This alligator clip, whoever designs these things, clearly only cares about one thing, and that is safety. And that's not what we're after today. We are hammering on a fuel pump while giving it voltage. That is not what I'm interested Safety is not what I'm interested in. Come on. It might be too far gone, guys. Ah, I think the pump is dead. It has perished. It's been down for too long. Nope, this is not working out too well. It was worth a shot. I called my buddy Eric and asked for some help and he brought over this tough book which has all of Mercedes uh, diagnostic equipment at the OEM stuff. So I've been in here uh, moving stuff around trying to take a look at where um, the CAN system is. Uh, all the connectors I need to check. The reason for that is the, the, the reason the key won't turn is it's, it's got a breakdown in the CAN system. So something's pulling the system down. 
Uh, I'll kind of show you how I figured that out or how that was figured out. So on your EIS module, this connector here has three wires that are required uh, to be connected for the key to turn the ignition. These are literally just outputs for voltage or input and output for voltage. That's your normal ignition switch wires. But here you've got a power, a ground, and a K line. And we, we tested for power. We uh, took some little pins that I have here and, and my meter and we have power, we have ground, which only leaves the K line, which is part of the network. And uh, then we try to connect the scan tool to it. And that's what we're going to do right now. System diagnosis can. Trouble codes. There's the codes that I saw earlier. Short and can wires, can wires are interrupted. Well, sorry about the rolling bars, guys, but this is, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Here is the X36 connector. That's the can connector that's on the left side of the dash. That's the one that has the ignition switch, according to this. So X36, left front SAM, right front SAM, steering column module. There we are, EIS, EZS control unit. That's the ignition switch. So I've, I think I've identified which CAN wires are coming from that. So I'm gonna isolate everything else. We're gonna hopefully get rid of this one, this one. We might leave the instrument cluster. I don't I, I'd have to pull every single one of these to figure out which is which. I think we can leave the gateway module. I can figure that out. And, um, but we're gonna try to delete all of these and bring them back one at a time. And hopefully we can turn this key when we f isolate which one is the problem. So this is how I did that. I went, I got two of these disconnected. You see right here. I, I found uh, which color wire is the K line, which is this wire right here, that red striped brown wire. And then I found that same color wire on this connector for the ignition switch. And then I did a continuity test between this. And then I did the, this bus bar essentially is what it is, a can bus bar. And then I did this one on its own. And then I did this one. And when I did this one, we have continuity, like so. One of the things I'm starting to notice is that this connector does not like to fit in this this can connector. It just does not like it. Get out here, like, leave. Hey. Uh, so I don't know if that was the problem. I, originally, when I took this all apart to get the EIS out to program a key, I think I disconnected all of these, which I don't... Uh, I know I, I tried doing this with this disconnected, and then I reconnected it, but... I don't understand why I can't get this one back in. So I'm going to play with this a little longer and see if we can get that back in. Because if this wasn't seated, that could have been our problem all along. Okay, we've made some more progress. And uh, I called my buddy Ed and he helped me out. So I did a, I did test continuity from the high can wire, which is this wire right here on the gateway module. And when I had all of these plugged in to this bus bar, I had continuity with both sides. So it was shorted. So one of these is shorting out the CAN system. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a continuity test between each of these. I'm gonna to try to isolate which one of these is the data link connector, which one of these is the gateway module, and which one of these is the EIS. And if I can only have those things in the system and, there's, and those things are not shorted, the key should turn. That's all I'm trying to do here is just get the key to turn. All right, let's see if we can get this done here. I'm gonna do these one at a time. We're gonna make sure that these do not have communication with, or continuity between the two. All right. No, this is very difficult. I need different uh, pins here. All right, so that one's good. All right, well, that one tests okay. There's no corrosion anywhere in here. So it's not like it had a water problem or moisture intrusion. I think I have an idea. We're gonna try to find X35. Um, basically, we've, we've gone through X36 right here, and we've gone through X34, but uh, the way that this reads, it looks like it goes from, oh my God, that's not what I wanted to do. I, I am bad at using this, just FYI. Also not what I wanted to do. Um, oh, hey, I can scroll. So X34, X35, and X36, they all are connected right here. 
and then there's some others that connect. Well, actually they don't. So this is it right here. This is the linking, oh my God, stop. This is the linking one right here. So I, I've had a good look at 34. I've had a good look at 36, but I haven't looked at 35 and it says 35 is, um, hold on. Thirty-five is basically the same place as thirty-four, just on the other side. So we're gonna pull that apart and see what that looks like. The seat was acting up pretty strangely, and if you remember uh, the left front seat control modules on that one. So let's uh, and the, the driver's door and it controls all the windows. The windows went down as soon as I powered on this car, so I think there might be some problems there. But let's dig in and see what we can find. All right, I pulled the carpet up. Dugout X thirty-five. It doesn't look like it's corroded. I don't see any major issues here. Uh, it doesn't look like this side has been wet. So that's a good sign. Uh, however, uh, I am looking at uh, these connectors and it looks like what I believe is that uh, this one comes from, since it goes from 36 to 35 to 34, the one that was creating a problem and throwing codes was this one. If I plug that one in and run the test it will throw a, an interrupted code a 9306 but if i if i leave that disconnected it doesn't throw the code which doesn't mean that that's the problem it just means that the problem is further down the chain because what i believe the way this works is that this connector since it's got that little identifier on it is the same as this connector which i can prove in a continuity test this one right there i can prove that in a continuity test that's probably what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of get better access to all this. We'll do a continuity test, prove that, and we're just going to work down the chain. Let's do a little recap. That is X36. That is X35. And this one in the footwell is X34. So when I disconnect X34 from X35, it doesn't throw codes. But when I reconnect it, it does throw codes, which tells me the problem is with this side here. This is where the problem is with the CAN network and I have it throwing a code now. So what I'm going to do is disconnect each one of these one at a time. Close. But then as I was digging in here, look at that connector. And there's obviously been a water in here. There's tons of corrosion everywhere, even up there on that junction. This is not, not looking good. So basically what I'm doing is I will pull one connector from this bus bar and then I will delete the codes. Let's just erase the codes. Actually, before we do that, let's pull one of these. I've done my test. Those are all good circuits, and I have three bad ones, which is not really a surprise. Um, I really expected one, but there are three. So now that there are no trouble codes, let's see if that ignition turns. Bad news, guys, it still doesn't turn. So while I may have fixed a problem uh, or eliminated a problem, it is not the only problem. Well, we have a blown fuse here, fuse number 78. It's a seven and a half, so we're gonna put a 10 in it just for 25% extra capacity. And it just popped the fuse. Yep, cool. So I found fuse 78 right here. And it looks like it goes to the steering column module, the alarm signal horn, the engine control module, and the ignition switch. I don't believe the ignition switch is the problem. But you know, those connectors on that uh, engine control module look pretty rough. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to disconnect the engine control module. We're going to put another fuse in it and we're going to see if it pops. If it doesn't, we're kind of stuck in the water. I don't have another computer and this is the end of the line for me. But if it does, then it's uh, either the steering column module or the alarm signal. We'll find those, disconnect them and hope for the best. They put these engine control modules in the, the literally the worst spot possible. This is it here. It's actually pretty loose in here, but I have been playing around with this, trying to get that loose, fixing that fuse. So let's pull these connectors out. Uh, that one's not too bad, but this area fills up with water because stuff comes off the windshield, the drains get clogged. Uh, let's keep going here. Oh, that didn't feel good. Oh no, it's, it's, 
Okay, let's keep going. I don't see anything terrible yet. Just it's not it's not perfect. That's corroded. Let's get this one. This is the power and ground connector. Typically, you have to have power and ground for you to have a lot of corrosion through electrolysis. That is not coming out. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Yep. Lots of corrosion in this connector. A little bit over here. These three look pretty decent, although there's a little bit in this. But that is that is bad. We're going to open this up and see if it's corroded on the inside. A lot of corrosion came out of that when I pulled that. Well, that side doesn't look too bad. Does this come? Oh, this is sealed to this. I can't see what the back side looks like. This really doesn't look too bad. I expected uh, a lot worse. I don't see any problems with the board. I've seen, I've pulled these apart before, not just on these cars, but all cars, and you'll see all kinds of corrosion. Because if they're wet when there's power going through them, uh, it's bad. That, that you don't want that. But it can, that's pretty corroded right there. So I'm gonna put this back together. I'll try to go a little bit further. I don't know how much farther I can get with this car. It's uh, it's not looking too great. I'm gonna give the car. 12 volts and if this pops right away that means it's something else if it doesn't pop we'll connect the computer back up and see if it blows the fuse i got plenty of fuses here these big two-door cars are kind of a challenge here please don't pop or please pop okay awesome i'm not done yet so we have proved it is not the engine control module because it still blows a fuse with that disconnected. I mean, I suppose it could still be wiring, but we're gonna go to the next stop, which is the alarm signal horn, which according to the internet is in the left front fender, like behind the wheel, behind the fender liner. So let's go dig. I think that's all of it. Don't mind the beep and that's my uh, J box that shouldn't be hanging out of the car. All right, it's fixed. It's this thing right here. All right. It's not corroded looking. Let's go see if it blows the fuse again. Car has power again. The engine control module and the siren are disconnected. Now we're gonna install a fresh fuse, and if it pops, then we'll go to the steering column module. No pop. Now, I really wonder if we can turn the key. Come on, baby. Please be that. I don't really wanna fight anything else. Key turns. It doesn't start, but the key turns on its own. <laughs> it says computing data. Computing data? Climate control's on. I think that the uh, jump box is low, so let's put the other one on it and see if we can get it to crank on its own power. Let's turn the key off. Oh, that's so awesome. The DME is connected again. If the key still turns, we're still good. Oh, the key is still in the right position. Here we go. Nope, unhappy. So because it doesn't engage the starter, let me see if I need to be on the brake. I wonder if I have to be on the brake for that to happen. Nope, it doesn't want to engage the starter. I don't have anything disconnected. So let's see if we can uh, hook up a Noid light and test for injector pulse before I give this an alternate fuel source. All right, there's the Noid light. No pulse. That's not good. Let's try it one more time. Nope. Okay, let's go pull codes out of the engine control unit for the first time. Does it communicate? If it doesn't communicate, we're pretty much dead in the water here. I think that's that corrosion 
Fingers crossed. Oh, man. <gasps> We're in. Trouble codes. Uh, <laughs> stored in current, stored in current, stored in current. Something is shorted to ground. Oh, man. This is a whole, it's got to be that all that corrosion. Let's just fix it by deleting them all and see what comes right back, which is going to be everything because if everything was stored in current. <laughs> uh, yep, yep. Oh, there's less of them. Throttle, PO 120s, some throttle codes. Short circuit to battery or open circuit for the intake air temp sensor. Air flap, electrical fault, throttle valve, short circuit to ground. Let me go dig around and see if I can find any reasons why. Well, I found a missing fuse, a 20 amper in this fuse box. Uh, I didn't know that it was missing a fuse because you could barely see the terminals because everything's kind of corroded. But since I replaced that, I cleared the codes. I only have a fuel tank level code, which I'm not really that worried about. And I can hear the throttle body humming along, which is a good sign. I have verified that when you use the throttle pedal, the gas pedal, the throttle plate moves. So that's awesome. So now we're going to be the starter relay again because it still doesn't start or engage the starter. And we're going to see if we have injector pulse. All right, here we go. Oh, that was kind of promising. Let's give... I have no idea what that was. We're just going to annoy, ignore that sound, and then we're going to give it some ether. Oh, yeah. Let's do that again. Still don't have injector pulse, but it's running on either. Well, it runs, but I still, I ain't got injector pulse. But why? Let's go run the codes again now that we had it kind of running. Let's see, electronic ESM. Oh, it's got lots of codes. Can, air pump. Charcoal canister, oxygen sensor. All right, so that's stored. We're gonna just fix it by deleting them. Uh, all kinds of code still. All right, or crank, so. Throttle plate is clicking around. Look at that. Just one code. Uh, I did that last time also. So I think I have one chance to see if I have injector pulse before I spend the time it takes to hook up another fuel source. So let's go see if we have injector pulse. No pulse. It does run without knocking though. And I can tell you the pulley on the blower sounds Absolutely terrible. I don't know how much more I want to try this. Now. I think I'm going to call it guys. I heard the engine run. It doesn't knock. It doesn't sound wonderful because starting fluid is not the correct fuel, but it does run. And uh, I can do a compression test on it now. I can do a leak down test on it. I feel good about being able to communicate with everything. We know we've got corrosion in the DME. I think I'm going to call it, man, I really wanted to get this thing to run and idle, but I just, 
I don't see it happening. Time was not nice to this car. This certainly isn't the ending I wanted. I really wanted to hear this thing rev and idle and see how everything sounded, but everything starts to get stacked against that idea. Between the pulley on the supercharger looking like it's going to explode at any moment, and God knows how old the oil is. I don't know if there's coolant in it or not. There's a lot of question marks. Plus, there's clearly some other wiring issues in this car. Time does not do these cars any, any favors at all. These cars do not like sitting in the weeds. They don't like sitting outside. And while this was a very, very expensive car, a lot of cars that are now 20 and 30 years old that are in dire need of either repair or being put out of their misery were expensive new also. And, you know, it just takes one type of owner to wreck a car. I'm not going to say anything about the person that owned this because this came out of a tow lot. So I don't really know the scenario. It could be that no one could figure out what I figured out of what was wrong with it. Or maybe everything I found was stuff that the elements and time caused to it. Either way, I feel a little bit better. I know the mileage of the car. I'm able to turn the key. So I know the key and the ignition, that whole system worked. I know that the engine doesn't sound like a box of rocks that's getting ready to explode. So I have confidence that the bottom end is good. We're going to do a compression and leak down test when this thing gets inventoried. I will not sell the computer out of this because I suspect that is the reason we don't have injector pulse amongst some of the other issues that came up in codes. Either way, I don't always come out smelling like of roses. It's not always the case. I know in a lot of videos in the past, I've generally been successful and I would be lying if I told you that I kind of pick stuff where I would hope that the outcome would be uh, favorable. You know, my intuition, my experience usually tells me how something will end up. And, you know, I don't have extra CL55s or any 215 chassis Mercedes around. So I don't have extra gateway modules or SAMs or engine controllers or any extra parts for these cars. This is the only one I have which makes fixing it on the cheap a lot more daunting. But either way, I'm still somewhat content. I'll feel good about selling the drivetrain. These are great engines. They generally don't have problems unless they've been abused. You know, 140,000 miles. Wouldn't call that exactly low, but it's not terrible considering the car is 20 years old. This was, without a doubt, 10 times hotter than the burned Miata. Uh, Miatas I know very well, and I have 10 of at any time. This, I don't know very well. I had to enlist the help of my friend Eric and my friend Ed. They walked me through several steps of the diagnosis process, and I could iron out some issues. Now, I don't know whether the can issues I found were going to keep this thing from getting this far. I didn't realize there was another fuse box in the car, but either way, I can sleep better knowing that I got this as far as I could. I generally don't spend as much time trying to get cars running in other salvage yards, other businesses. I guarantee you they don't go through this kind of work because it just totally negates any kind of profit, the time invested. But I'd like to show you guys how far we will go. You know, we'll, we'll check the oil filter for metal and the oil for metal. We'll do some things to make sure that what we're selling is good. Put a bore scope in the cylinders. The normal stuff we would do on an engine like this is probably worth three or $4,000. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's outside of the norm, but maybe it will become the new norm, but hopefully not quite this bad. I, I don't think I could do this again for a while. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.